Greetings and welcome back to Room 303, the Harvard Classics Lectures. This is lecture number 88. We are now going to turn to John Stuart Mill's autobiography and his classic philosophic essay on liberty. Now, we've referenced in 303 almost constantly John Stuart Mill without giving, unfortunately, always proper attribution. He stands behind so much of what we do in 303. In fact, some students have claimed in their studies with us in 303 that if half the class is Burke, the great conservative thinker, then the other half of the instruction, pedagogically speaking, is John Stuart Mill's, the great, really liberal thinker. And, and we try, obviously, in 303 to marry the two together, uh, maybe not always successfully. We're going to look at two of his texts. We're going to look at his autobiography from 1873, actually published right before he died, and then uh, his classic on liberty from 1859. Um, in, in many ways, the philosophy of education that we enjoy in 303 is born of so much the Socratic method of Plato's dialogues and John Stuart Mill's autobiography. Just to give you a sense of how the language for Mill's is so expertise, so brilliant, so erudite, and yet at the same time so accessible, I just want to spend a few minutes just sharing, I, guys, I've said this so many times in my lectures and posted it at learnstrong.net, I would love to be able to just read all of the autobiography and On Liberty to you, I just don't have the time to do that. But I do want to give you a sense of how his autobiography is so beautifully written, so elegantly constructed. I'll just read you the first uh, um, in, in introductory paragraph, and then we'll turn to a few other lines before we get into a, a little bit more of the autobiography and then, of course, On Liberty. He says it this way, it seems proper that I should prefix to the following biographical sketch some mention of the reasons which have made me think it desirable that I should leave behind me such a, mem uh, such a memorial of so uneventful a life as mine. The humility, obviously, we've spoken often of. The, the only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the virtue of the wisdom of humility. Um, here, he says, I, I didn't live a very eventful life, which is, of course, hyperbolic at best very well known in his lifetime and obviously after his life, very influential. He says, I do not for a moment imagine that any part of what I have to relate can be interesting to the public as a narrative or as being connected with myself, but I have thought that in an age in which education and its improvement are the subject of more, if not of profounder study than in any period, uh, former period of English history, it may be useful that there should be some record of an education which was unusual and remarkable in which, whatever else it may have done, has proved how much more than is commonly supposed may be taught and well taught in those early years which in the common modes of what is called instruction are little better than wasted. Uh, it, it's, we'll pause, it, it is true that Mill will argue that everything we are is about our education. I mean, if you'll think about it, we've said this for a long time in 303, we are the stories we tell, the stories we retell, the stories we accept, and quite frankly, the stories we also reject. It seems to me that this autobiography of Mill, as well as, as, as his On Liberty, and then of course all of the other texts, his subjugation of women, and all the other texts that he's, that he's written, so vital to a time such as the one that we are now living in. He continues, it has also seemed to me that in an age of transition in opinions, there may be somewhat both of interest and a benefit in noting the successive phases of any mind which is always pressing forward, equally ready to learn and to unlearn either from its own thoughts or from those of others. And so will be smiling as I now use this word learn. Of course, everything in 303 is about learning, showing proper respect, asking what we can learn, and then notice here, unlearn. We are the stories not only we accept, but the stories we reject as well. But before we begin to reject stories, we need to know those stories and treat them with the due amount of respect that should be shown to them. Here already, notice in the opening lines, Mill is trending in that direction. He says, but a motive which weighs more with me than either of these is a desire to make acknowledgement of the debts which my intellectual and moral development owes to other persons. Some of them have recognized eminence, others less known than they deserve to be, and the one to whom most of all is due, one whom the world had no opportunity of knowing. The reader whom these themes do not interest 
has only himself to blame if he reads further, and I do not desire any other indulgence from him than that of bearing in mind that for him these pages were not written. Sounding very much like the opening lines of Marcus Aurelius's meditations. Go back and take a look at our lecture at learnstrong.net on this one. Notice here, he says it's his duty to talk about the debt that is owed. And again, as we've often said in 303, if you're going to be a, a, a scholar, if you're going to be a, a, a true student, if you're going to seek for wisdom, which is the way Plato always spoke of, of course, the idea of what education should be about, you have to remember that you do owe a sense of debt to those who have helped you become who you are. Now, of course, let's remind ourselves, Mill says this regularly through his autobiography. When we say education, we mustn't just think that we're talking about schooling. No, 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 no. Schooling is a small, small part of our education. Vital, we would hope vital, important, we would hope important, but it isn't exclusively what we mean when we talk about education. John Stuart Mill was ostensibly homeschooled, is the term we would use today, especially by his father. And he has any number of insights right away about his father. He speaks of his father's prodigious energy, and of course we talk regularly about energy and the importance of energy in 303, but he will say it this way, he says, but my father in all his teaching demanded of me not only the utmost that I could do, but much that I could by no possibility have done. In other words, as we've sometimes said in 303, uh, this instructor always tries to teach just an inch and a half above your head, uh, an inch and a half above your cognitive capacity, much is, uh, is borrowed here from the idea of John Stuart Mill's father. Challenging ourselves, that's the key, right? Challenging ourselves to be a little bit more than we are, a little bit better than we are already. We'll go through it in more detail, but uh, uh, just early on he says it this way, in my eighth year, that is eight years old, uh, I, so, some of my students have said when we study this together, it's like very embarrassing and it's insulting almost because, uh, you know, we're, we're not worthy, right, to stand in the shadow of a man who at eight years old, we're told, commenced learning Latin in, ch in conjunction with a younger sister to whom I taught it as I went on and who afterwards repeated the lessons to my father. And from this time, other sisters and brothers being successfully added as pupils, a considerable part of my day's work consisted of this preparatory teaching. At eight years old, he's already teaching Latin. He says about this teaching concepts to others. It was a part which I greatly disliked, the more so as I was held responsible for the lessons of my pupils in almost as full a sense as for my own. I, however, derived from this discipline the great advantage of learning more thoroughly and retaining more lastingly the things which I was set to teach. It's an interesting idea and of course, we've played games with, uh, in 303 with how do you improve uh, public education and private education. One argument is simply that if students are not capable of understanding the material, we turn the critical eye on teachers and ask, what could we as teachers have done better to make sure we understood it? Notice here, he had some great concerns that his father was going to judge him harshly as instructor if his younger brother sisters could not understand the material uh, in Latin. What an interesting challenge. I mean, obviously some of us smiling already about something like this. Um, I'll just jump over a few more lines. He says it this way, about logic and the importance of logic, especially in our youth. Logic, a study peculiarly adapted to an early stage in the education of philosophical students, since it does not presuppose the slow process of acquiring by experience and reflection valuable thoughts of their own. They may become capable, students in other words, of disentangling the intricacies of confused and self-contradictory thought before their own thinking faculties are much advanced, a power which, for want of some such discipline, many otherwise able men altogether lack. And when they have to answer opponents, only endeavor by such arguments as they can command to support the opposite conclusion, scarcely even attempting to confute the reasoning of their antagonists, and therefore at the utmost, leaving the question as far as it depends on argument, a balanced one. Learning how to properly deduce an argument, that is to say, we're back to Plato and his understandings of dialectic. Speaking of Plato, at a very young age, already, he says it was at this period, that I read for the first time some of the most important dialogues of Plato. In particular, he will mention the Gorgias. Of course, we 
have given lectures on Plato's dialogues, and we mentioned the Gorgias there, the Protagoras, as well as the Republic. And then he says, and this is one of the great debts to 303, there is no author to whom my father thought himself more indebted for his own mental culture than Plato, or whom he more frequently recommended to young students. And then Mill will finish this observation, I can bear similar testimony in regards to myself. The Socratic method, he says, of which the Platonic Dialogues are the chief example, is unsurpassed as a discipline, and I would argue, as we have many times argued in 303, no doubt, learn your Plato, and you'll be able to have all kinds of abilities, intellectual cognitive abilities, to make all kinds of conjunctions and connections. Remember, we, we argue learning is the ability to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. Uh, Mill's father helping helping the young John Stewart to get there through the study of Plato. It's also interesting what Mill has to say about his ability to learn how to read aloud. We emphasize this idea in 303 as well as memorizing texts so that we can recite them aloud to each other and obviously to the instructor sometimes for scores, yes? He says it this way, in going through Plato and uh, Demosthenes, since I could now read these authors as far as the language was concerned, with perfect ease. I was not required to construe them sentence by sentence, but to read them aloud to my father, answering questions when asked. But the particular attention which he paid to elocution, in which his own excellence was remarkable, made this reading aloud to him a most painful task. Of all things which he required me to do, there was none which I did so constantly ill, or in which he so perpetually lost his temper with me. He had thought much on the principles of the art of reading, especially the most neglected part of it, the inflections of the voice, or modulation, as writers on elocution call it, in contrast with articulation on the one side and expression on the other, and had reduced it to rules grounded on logical analysis of a sentence. These rules he strongly impressed upon me, and took me severely to task for every violation of them. But I even then remarked, though I did not venture to make the remark to him, and though he reproached me when I read a sentence ill and told me how I ought to have read it, he never by reading it himself showed me how it ought to be read. Mill goes on to say that maybe he sees some problems with the fact that my, his father put this kind of pressure on him. This attempt at elocution, though, we have said before, such a hypercritical one. Go back to our comments on um, Francis Bacon's Of Studies, a text that obviously reads rather nicely at 3A with uh, Mills's autobiography. You'll remember that he talks about how important it is reading makes us ready, he, he will say, right? And of course, it leads to proper discourse and the like. To, uh, to finish um, just the final comments here, then we'll get on with some explication. I love this line from chapter one of the autobiography. He says about pupils, a pupil, a pupil from whom nothing is ever demanded, which he cannot do, never does all he can. What a, what a brilliant insight. The idea here being, we must be challenged if we are going to be true students. Well, let's turn to John Stuart Mill now. Let's talk for a few moments uh, about his biography, especially through the autobiography. He is born the 20th of, of May, 1806, and will die the 7th of May, uh, 1873. Uh, usually considered a great British philosopher, he, he wrote a lot on political economy, and of course, as well, he was himself a great uh, civil servant. One, without doubt, one of the most important thinkers, influential thinkers of classical liberalism, as it sometimes is referred to, um, of course, had all a lot to say about social theory, political theory, political economy, and the like. Um, sometimes called the most influential English-speaking philosopher of the 19th century. There's obviously debate about this, right? Of course, his thinking, his ideas about liberty, justifying the freedom of the individual, especially in opposition to the power of the state. We will get into this in social control. He was a proponent of utilitarianism. Let's get that one in our notes, especially, of course, because his father, so influenced by uh, Jeremy Bentham, Bentham the great uh, utilitarian thinker. He was a member of the Liberal Party, author of an early feminist work, The Subjugation of Women, which is a must-read that sits right up there with, uh, with Wollstonecraft's um, um, classic um, declaration and any number of other titles that we will put in that great feminist tradition, as we sometimes will refer to it. He was uh, um, uh, the second member to call for women's suffrage 
um, after Henry Hunt in 1832. That is significant. Well, from the autobiography, let's just make some quick observations. A precocious child doesn't even begin to come close as we think about people like uh, John uh, Milton or, or Francis Bacon, who I mentioned already. Um, really, in many ways, his autobiography is, as we've said, just an analysis of, of his education. At three, he's taught Greek. At eight, he's already reading Aesop's and, and, and the dialogues of Plato, as we just mentioned. Um, great deal of history uh, of the English uh, history and English language. He also is going to learn his arithmetic, his physics, and his astronomy at quite a young age. By eight, he's, we've already said, studying Latin and, of course, Euclid and geometry as well. Um, he's also reading the important Latin and Greek, and Greek historians, um, especially his study of Herodotus. He will claim very influential for it. Um, um, he, he was challenged to read and compose poetry, although he claims that, unlike John Milton, he's not much of a poet. Interestingly, his father was not a huge fan of Shakespeare, but rather Milton. Um, he, actually, one of the very earliest things he did as a young kid was to try to write a continuation of the Iliad in Greek. Right? He also spent quite a bit of time reading Don Quixote and uh, Robinson Crusoe, both of these titles. Uh, adventures, we might say, adventure titles uh, for, for him he loved. His father publishes uh, what he considers one of the greatest texts of, of, of English, the history of British uh, India, in 1818. And around the age of 12, that's when really Mill begins his close study of logic with his father as well as Aristotle's, um, uh, Aristotle's works. The following year, he's introduced uh, to political economy. He studies Adam Smith, we've already given lectures on, and uh, David Ricardo um, um, with, uh, with his father. And ultimately, he does complete this kind of classical economic view. Um, and and uh, this uh, Ricardo is a close friend, actually, of his father's, and he and young uh, Mill will begin to have their conversation. At age 14, Travel now becomes a part of his instruction. We have often said that, uh, oh, how much fun it would be if we could travel together and uh, go to different parts of the world, maybe you know, studying our Plato in Athens and that kind of thing. This is exactly what happens for him at age 14. He goes to stay for a year in France um, with uh, the family of Samuel Bentham, uh, the brother of Jeremy Bentham. It is significant that it's France. He'll end up uh, buried there along with his, uh, his longtime dear close friend and his wife. Uh, France for him is a is a you know one of those perennial cultures, and he and he loves it. He also loved the mountains, and it will, it will be this these mountain landscapes that will become for him central to a whole lot of his thinking. He loves the life of walking, and so he'll spend a lot of time going on walks. Very influenced by Wordsworth in this regards. Uh, he he enjoys Paris as one of the great as one of the great cities of the world, right? Then Mills has what different scholars have tried to explain. Uh, some have called it a prolonged uh, depression. Some have seen it as, um, as something even more profound. He, he himself says that he did, at 20 years of age, 20, 21 years of age, uh, consider suicide. Uh, he began to have serious doubts, sounding very much like Tolstoy in his autobiography, serious doubts about the whole point of what it means to live a, a, a good life. Um, the, however, he finds his way through this experience, commenting on his father. When his father died, he said he was pleased because he had left the world a better place than he had found it, a line that, of course, in 303 we use regularly. Interestingly, put it in your notes, it's the poetry of Wordsworth. We've given lots and lots of lectures on Wordsworth, of course. Uh, Ten Turn Abbey and uh, uh, The World is Too Much With Us comes to mind. It's Wordsworth who actually helps him to find his way out, and for the rest of his life, he will work towards creating a more just society, and he will enjoy the experience as he goes. This is a pivotal shift, no question, in his thinking, no doubt about that. And some of the differences between he and his father um, and his uh, begin, beginning to critique utilitarianism will, will begin, obviously, during this time. Um, in 1851, Mill will marry Harriet Taylor. 21 years they had this very intimate relationship, but not sexually intimate during the time that her uh, first husband was alive. 
but they will marry. Uh, and then it will be during those years um, um, that the two will begin to work together. Um, for two years, they wait after the death of her husband, and then in 1851, they marry. Mill was convinced she was one of the brightest people that he ever met. Um, significant influence on Mill's work uh, and the ideas during friendship and, of course, marriage. Um, this will be the beginnings or reinforcing of his notions about women's rights and, of course, the suffrage movement. Uh, he said in his stand against domestic violence um, uh, and women's rights that he was, quote, uh, chiefly an amanuensis to my wife, end quote. In other words, uh, she, she was very influential in his life, and he always said about her uh, that her mind was a perfect instrument, the most eminently qualified of all those known to the author. In other words, he places her intellectually as not just his equal, but as his superior, which is quite a remarkable thing. She will be the great influence for him on, uh, uh, in the writing of On Liberty, published um, shortly after her death. Um, she dies in 1858. She had severe uh, lung congestion and um, only, unfortunately, seven years of marriage to Mill, and he, and he mourned her, ultimately buried in France uh, next to her when he dies. We now turn to the classic on liberty. And I just want to work through, first of all, some uh, preliminary ideas, and then we'll go uh, chapter by chapter through this work. Again, I would love to just read every word of On Liberty. That's really the way it should be taught. And there are, uh, there are uh, Mill scholars that say you have to really delve deep into a text like On Liberty to really understand what's going on. I'm, unfortunately, we're just going to be hitting the epidermal uh, level here, but I'll do my best to help us to have some sense of what's going on. It is a philosophic essay, published, as we said, in 1859. It is Mill's ethical system of utilitarianism applied to first the society and then the state. Okay? He's going to suggest standards for relationships between authority and liberty. Okay, and that that's I put that in my I would put that in my notes right away. The 